This conference will now be recorded. All right, everybody, welcome to today's Coda Bears Lunch and Learn. Your presenter is going to be Joe Johnson going over inventory. I do have everyone muted, so if you have questions, go ahead and put them into the chat window and we'll get those as soon as Joe's done presenting. We'll come back and answer all the questions. This session is being recorded. It will appear up on our uh, YouTube channel. So we'll have those up probably the beginning of next month. So just give us a little bit to get them converted and posted up there. Uh, if you or a colleague wants to be notified when those videos are available and you're not on that email list, send a message to sales at codabears.com. You can also send a message there if you wish to be included in future invitations to Lunch and Learns. So I'll turn it over to Joe and I'll mute my camera and mic here. Awesome. All right. Today I'm going to be reviewing the basics of Epicor Warehouse's bins, cycle counts, and units of measurement, kind of as they pertain to inventory. So starting with warehouses, they're a way to group your materials. Um, and we've got physical warehouses and bins and logical warehouses and bins. Physical is going to denote you know, actual warehouses or separate physical items, whereas the logical might be groups of materials. Um, and we'll go over that in a bit for the grouping materials. Your bins, you can set up with rack location, floor location, hold slash quarantine cage. It's all going to depend on where you want those additional zones to be within your warehouses. So some additional examples of warehouses, you might build some logical warehouses as raw versus finished goods. You might have a company owned, a customer managed, vendor managed, quality or quarantined. And so you, you can actually set your customer or vendor on the warehouse itself and make sure that they're managing that material. I've also got printer set up. So your auto printers can be set up for specific warehouses. This is going to allow you to auto print labels or pick lists for sales orders so they go to the correct location. So you might set up three different warehouses within one physical warehouse, and those might manage different materials, might have different pick lists or labels printed out, and that'll give you three different locations. You can also set up GL controls for your warehouses. So if you have different groupings of parts that need to be reported separately for financials, you can group them. Uh, and each warehouse can have its own general ledger control, which is going to tie back to the division segment. That way your transactions in the warehouse are affected by a revenue stream and they'd all be kept together. So you might do this for, say, two separate sectors. Maybe you have medical and aerospace and you want to keep the revenue and inventory separate. You would put them in their own warehouses, set them up with separate jail controls, and then you'd be able to keep all those transactions separate. Bins, I'm going to talk through setup of bins, um, starting with the zones. Zones are used to keep to group your bins within a warehouse. So they need to be created in bin zone maintenance to become selectable. But they're going to keep items. Typically, you're going to use them to keep items that are commonly bought together in the same zones. And that's going to allow for a reduction in travel time. You might use that for, say, a zone for just computer parts, right? You're going to keep all of your computer parts together because commonly they're going to be purchased together. That way your pickers go out and they're going to just the one zone. Sizes. Sizes on bins, they're going to allow you to determine what bins are acceptable for parts. You could have ranges from a pallet to a small part size. And these need to be created within bin size maintenance first to select them. Um, and while you'll be able to see that on the bin, you're not, Epicor is not going to reason for you that your part isn't going to fit in the bin. You'd need additional customizations to do anything like that, but it is a potential customization you could use. Sequences, this is going to follow your footpath down an aisle. It's going to sort pick list by the walking path rather than the alphabetical by bin number. Uh, and this is sequence you're often going to see be done. You can do an automatic setup for bins, and this sequence is going to play a heavy role in that. The inactive checkbox, that will turn your bin off, but you have to have zero inventory to do that. Non-nettable inventories will not be included in on-hand quantities. Portable checkbox, 
if you select this, you're not going to be able to set a location because essentially you're saying you're going to be able to move that bin around. Uh, it's not going to be a one place. If you ever want to remove the portable, you're going to put it in one location. You're going to have to assign a location to be able to save that record. Your types, you've got standard. That's going to be the bulk of most inventory locations. Contract, customer managed, and supplier managed. For the customer and supplier, that's again, you can choose who the customer or supplier is that's managing that bin. Locations, you'll be able to set your aisle, face, and elevation. And that's again only if it's not portable. If you set this bin as portable, you won't be able to fill those in. Fulfillment settings, it's used for replenishment with the advanced material management module. So you've got your wave replenishment, you've got wave max fill, and wave percent fillable. The max fill is your max fillable on each wave, and then the percent fillable is what percent you want fillable by each wave. Talk about cycle counting. So cycle counting is a perpetual inventory auditing procedure. So you're following a repeated sequence of checks on your inventory, as opposed to doing a typical wall-to-wall -wall where you count, try to count everything in one go. Um, this is going to be small bits over time. Your parameters can be defined at the site level or by warehouse. Cycle counting in Epicor is typically a daily process based on counting a specific number of ABC coded parts. High value parts are going to be counted more frequently than your lower value parts and you're going to define a lot of that with the ABC codes. Cycle count slash physical inventory, cycle count methods. So you're going to use plant settings is an option um, so you can just pull that straight from the site otherwise your options are repetitive or random and you can bring those in straight at the warehouse level you have the option to exclude your zero quantity on hand and negative quantity on hand the zero quantity on hand comes in handy if you haven't had any parts on hand in a long time so you might have obsolete parts that you aren't working with anymore do you really want to count those You'll be able to separate those out for, from your cycle counts at the warehouse level. ABC codes. So these are specific to each warehouse and they're used to differentiate tolerances on parts. So this is kind of where we're talking about maybe you've got you're storing gold um, and you're going to want you're going to have a much higher or lower tolerance when you're counting gold for what can be missing. Um, you're going to want to count it much more frequently than other lower cost parts. You also have the ability to override stock valuation and count frequency, and it allows you to kind of bring in granular permissions on the warehouses. Oftentimes we'll see that warehouses are set up specifically for cycle count, so you can set up these ABC codes, especially for your more expensive parts. Units of measurement. So units of measurement are going to be used. They're enforced in Epicor. Um, they weren't previously in Vantage, but they are now. You must have at least one unit of measurement. And as you create the units of measurement, you're going to need to create UOM classes. So you've got types here. These are the standard types, each foot, pound, gallon, square inch, box, case, dozen, hour, and sheet. So this is typically what you're going to be putting on the part. Um, and in part-specific UOMs, when they're set on a part, they need to go through a conversion process if you want to make any changes. Being able to convert between UOM classes is convenient for purchasing an inventory. For example, if you were purchasing sheets of lead and you want to store them by length, you're going to have to have a conversion in place to be able to do so. And you can set that here on the part. If a part needs, if you need to change its UOM, you're going to have to take all inventory out of the system, all sales orders and purchase orders need to be pulled, and then you can convert. It's a difficult process to make that adjustment, and sometimes it's easier just to make a new part, even though it's the same part, just make a slight change to the part number, and then set it up properly that way. Unit of measurement classes. These are the basics that we have. Typically count, length, weight, volume, area, time, and other. And I'll talk about a couple of special cases that have also been added. 
So these are sets of units of measurement that convert to your base unit of measurement within the class. Each class is going to have a single base and a default unit of measurement. Your base UOM is going to convert between the other UOMs within that class. So if you've got eaches and you're converting from a pack, you're going to define that conversion. Uh, maybe a pack holds 10 or 24. It's all going to depend on your business needs and how you need that to convert. So your count is kind of the fundamental class here. But then a couple of the kind of extra special ones are dual and on the fly. Dual is a dual class type. You can stock your items using a different unit of measurement for a single item in the same warehouse bin. If you select the dual option, you will need to assign another UOM to that part. You can then link the dual UOM class to a part using part maintenance. The dual UOM does require advanced unit of measurement module, so keep that in mind. There's also the on-the-fly UOM class, which allows for creation of UOM classes used in the process of transactions. So if you have on-the-fly part numbers, or if you've got, if you're configuring per customer specifications, um, the on-the-fly UOM works well. It is complex though for the conversions through the UOM class. All right, inventory UOM. So parts are stored and costing calculations are done with inventory UOM. Um, specifically for costing, costing is set on the cost table and it's going to use the UOM to calculate what you have in inventory. Depending on your business practices, parts will be stored on your UOM. Once you choose the UOM for your part, you're married to it unless you go through the conversion program. Purchasing UOM, it's going to default on purchase orders as supplier UOM. And then the sales unit of measurement, it's going to set your default on sales orders and quotes. And at this time, we will take questions. So if anyone has any questions, let us know and I can get them answered. Don't see any yet. Um, so please go ahead and type in your questions into the chat area and we'll handle those. If nobody's got any questions, then we'll uh, call it a day or call it a lunch and learn. So I will babble aimlessly while some people have some time to type into the chat window if they do have questions. And as a reminder, uh, this session is being recorded. We'll have it up on our YouTube channel. So that'll be out there probably the beginning of the next month here. And we do have a question from Jen. Supplier and customer manage bins. Do you need separate modules? So like separate Epicor modules, are those separate modules? Do you know, Joe? Those aren't separate modules. There you go, Jen. From our testing in Kinetic, we didn't have any problems with setting up both of those. Anybody other, any other questions, go ahead and type them into the chat window and we'll get them there. Jen says, nice, we struggle with VMI. Vendor yeah. managed inventory, always fun. From Michaela, do you have any info on the new tracking inventory by revision feature? How does that display in part tracker or part on hand display? Have you run into that yet, Joe? I have not. I have not. I'd have to look into that further. Okay. Sorry, Michaela, I don't have an answer for you on that one. Um, maybe we can do some research and get you an email back there, Michaela. Any other questions? I kind of feel like that teacher in the movie, Bueller, Bueller, anyone, anyone? <laughs> All right, we'll hang out for just another minute or so, just in case anyone's still typing, give them a chance to type in here. Otherwise, everyone, we appreciate that you attended our Lunch and Learns. Um, if you got any feedback, just uh, send an email off to sales at codabears.com, what we could do differently, uh, or if you have any advice for us, any uh, topics you might want covered, those are all appreciated as well. We're going to try and keep doing these uh, probably about once a week or so, uh, at least through the end of the year, 
and then we should be good. All right, I think I have not seen another question. So we'll go ahead and call it a day here, Joe. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. We hope you enjoyed the session. Bye now.